Well, thank you all again for coming out. Uh, sorry, I think we ran out of study guides. We'll print some more. If uh, you don't have one and you want to follow online, go to 516church.org. Uh, click on the menu, go to Digital Resources. It's under Media, Media, Digital Resources. Scroll down about four spots, and you'll see the Church History 101. So at least you can bring it up on your phone or your iPad. But again, excited y'all are here. Man, I can't believe y'all are excited about Church History. This is, y'all are some weird people. But uh, <laughs> that's true, that's true. I don't deny my weirdness, that's for sure. Anybody that knows my eating habits is already knows I'm, I got issues. But anyway, um, tonight we're going to try to work through, um, sort of review a little bit in case you've missed some of the first two weeks and talk about Augustine. We'll take a break and then afterwards talk a little bit about Gregory the Great, uh, the fall of Rome and Gregory the Great who really had a huge influence in the development of Catholicism, medieval Catholicism. And then I want to end with Patrick, um, St. Patrick, because I think that's just his story to me is very powerful. And after Gregory the Great, I sort of want to do something a little bit more on the positive side. Gregory Great's not, anybody that has to call themselves the Great, you just, you know, you're sort of a little, a little uh, wary of. So um, anyway, so that's, that's our game plan. Again, if you have questions, I hope to have some time for you to be able to answer, uh, ask those, and I'll try my best, at least maybe point you in, the, in a direction. And if you want to write questions to me during the week, whatever, just, just feel free to do that. But let me pray. Father, I do thank you uh, for your providence and how you have guarded, protected the church uh, for the last 2,000 years, and your son proclaimed that you... He was going to build his church, and the gates of hell would not stand against it. And we've seen that. From a human standpoint, it makes no sense why the church has survived, and yet here it is. Um, doesn't mean that our history is without its issues and without its problems. And so, Father, give us wisdom and discernment to be able to evaluate. Give me clarity of thought. And, Father, our main goal is that we'd understand our past so that we could learn from it and we could live faithfully in our present generation. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So to just to, uh, again, give you a little bit of background. If nothing else, I'm hoping you can start thinking through church history and understanding some of the major movements in church history. I call the first 300 years the age of persecution. Starts in A.D. 64. Uh, what happened in A.D. 64? Great fire of Rome. That's when Nero starts turning his target against Christians. That's when Rome begins to persecute Christians, and that's going to continue sporadically and regionally through the next 250 years. Uh, some of the major times of persecution are going to be with these seven emperors at different times. A.D. 70 is another important date because that's when Jerusalem was destroyed um, by a guy named Titus, who was the son of Vespasian, and that's significant because the Jewish nation was pretty much scattered all over the world and lost their identity in many ways. It also fed a little bit of anti-Semitism um, that's going to crop up in the church, which is not anything to be proud of. But, um, and I also think it affected their understanding of future times. They had some good views, but I don't think they fully understood how God still had a purpose for the nation of Israel. So that happened in AD 70, had a great impact on the Jewish faith. Apostles' Creed comes out about 150 in light of Gnosticism, which was one of the first heresies the church had to deal with. Despite persecution, despite heresy, the church continues to grow. That creates some alarm, and under Diocletian and uh, Galerius, the church is under severe persecution, starting near the end of the 3rd century and going into the 4th century. And the goal was the complete extinction of Christianity, to burn all of its books, and to kill all of its followers. And instead, in the end, Christianity was triumphant. And so then you go to what I call the Age of Prosperity. Uh, Constantine, his conversion, is a huge event in the history of the church. He eventually becomes emperor of the Roman Empire, and he is friendly towards Christianity. And because of that, he passes. 313 is a key date because that's the Edict of Milan. 
And the Edict of Milan allowed for freedom of religion in the Roman Empire. And for the first time, Christianity is not persecuted or not a um, look down upon faith. Actually, it becomes the favored faith in the Roman Empire. 325, the first controversy constantly has to deal with is this Arian heresy that Jesus, there was a time when he was not and it denied the eternality and the deity of Christ. And so the Nicene Creed is the emphasis on the deity of Christ. The Apostles' Creed had to protect his humanity. The Nicene Creed had to protect and declare his deity. 410 is going to be a key date. We're going to look at that. That's when Rome falls to the Visigoths and Alaric who invade. And so that's a huge event in history. And then 590 is when I sort of end this period of time, and that's when Gregory the Great becomes the Bishop of Rome. And we'll talk about why that is sort of significant. And so that's sort of the background. Again, to remind you from uh, Rodney Stark, Rise of Christianity, a good book to read. The Triumph of Christianity is another good one that he, re- he wrote. Based on his analysis, this is how he sees the church growing. Under persecution, the church continued to grow because of their ministry, because of their discipleship, because of their evangelism, uh, because of their courage in the face of persecution. And you can see by AD 300, you have about 10% of the population are Christians. After Constantine's conversion, quote-unquote, however God knows his heart, uh, you're going to see by 50 years later, it goes from 10% of the population to 56% of the population. Does that have a significant impact on Christianity? (laughs) Absolutely. And so that huge increase, I think you have to understand that had great impact. It's funny, there was a, um, I, can't, I can't remember all the Greek gods, um, and I can't remember who it was. I think it was Hercules. Hercules was fighting some Greek god, and he kept just uh, picking him up and just throwing him on the ground. <laughs> picking him up and throwing him on the ground. Well, this Greek god, his mother was the god of the earth. And so every time he threw this god down and he touched the earth, he became more powerful. And so Hercules keeps trying to defeat him by throwing him on the ground, Eventually, he realizes, man, he's getting stronger when I throw him on the ground. So then he picked him up and held him up in the air. He lost all of his power, and that's when Hercules was able to defeat him. Some people say that's a great picture of what Satan did. Satan tried to destroy the church, tried to destroy the church, and the more he tried to destroy it, the more it grew and became stronger. So then he took the church and he elevated it. And once he elevated it, it began to lose some of its power. And I think that's what happened in many ways. I do think that impacted um, the way the church worshipped. I think it impacted, I think paganism came into the church because when you have a flood of people bringing all their past beliefs in, a lot of times they're going to bring in some pagan beliefs. And so you have this sort of watering down and blending of Christian belief with some pagan practice. And so I told you about Constantine's impact. Monasticism began to flourish. People who did not like all these floods of people coming in. They left and went to the desert. Uh, Basilicas were built. You went from a church that either met in homes or met in very simple little buildings to suddenly massive basilicas being built um, with just incredible, elaborate displays of um, wealth. Hierarchy developed. Now you're going to start seeing a, a separation between the laity and the clergy. Again, if you're meeting in a home... Um, you're not, you know, if you were to come into my home to do a Bible study and you walked in and I had a huge robe on and a big old hat and I'm, you know, doing all kinds of things, you'd think this is the strangest home Bible study I've ever been in. And you would leave. And so the church had a very simple, yes, it had leadership, but the leadership was part of the flock. But now that you're meeting in these massive buildings, now it becomes more of a spectator and the people that are up front are now doing things in a very hierarchical way, a very imperial way. Paganism influenced church practice, which again, if you, if you want to read about that, um, Christianity and Paganism in the 4th to 8th centuries, written by Ramsey McCollin, is a book I would uh, recommend. He's not a believer, but I think he's fair in his treatment of that. And number five, hope was turned from heaven unto earth. When you're under persecution, what are you praying and longing for? <laughs> Christ to come back. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Now that the church has all this wealth and power, suddenly people aren't 
praying for that anymore. In fact, they're starting to realize, hey, we can establish the kingdom here on earth now. Um, I, I want to cover this because when we get to Augustine, amillennialism is going to become a belief. It really was not a belief until uh, Augustine is going to start elaborating on it. If these don't mean anything to you, just, uh, just tune out for a little bit. I don't know what else to say. Amillennialism, postmillennialism, and premillennialism. Y'all have heard of those terms before? Three different views. You have the millennium, uh, the thousand-year reign of Christ is mentioned in uh, Revelation chapter 20. And the question is, is that literal? And if it is literal, when does it happen? Amillennialism says that that is all um, basically allegory or spiritual symbolism. And so the church now is reigning in the millennium at the same time the church is fighting the forces of evil. Though Satan has been restrained, which seems hard to believe, but that's sort of the view is that that was all interpreted more spiritually. Postmillennialism believes the church is going to conquer the world. We're going to evangelize and we're going to take over. We're going to claim the land. And then at the very end, Christ is going to come back and he's going to congratulate us for doing a great job. Premillennialism believes that Though the church is going to be faithful, over time, the last days are going to get worse and worse until there's a time of tribulation. Christ will come back, and then he will establish his kingdom on earth in fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies. What do you think the early church was almost unanimous in their uh, understanding of the end times? Premillennial. It is almost without question. Um, uh, Papias, I think is his name. I always think of the fruit, papaya. But anyway, he was a disciple of John. There will be a millennium after the resurrection of the dead when the kingdom of Christ will be set up in material form on this earth. Justin Martyr, you've read some of his excerpts. I and others who are right-minded Christians on all points are assured that there will be a resurrection of the dead in a thousand years in Jerusalem, which will then be built, adorned, and enlarged as the prophets Ezekiel and Isaiah and others declare. Irenaeus, when the Antichrist shall have devastated all things in this world, he will reign for three and a half years and sit in the temple at Jerusalem. Then the Lord will come from heaven in the clouds and the glory of the Father sending this man and those who follow him into the lake of fire, but bringing in the times of the kingdom for the righteous. Tertullian, we do confess that a kingdom is promised to us upon the earth, although before heaven, only in another state of existence, inasmuch as it will be after the resurrection for a thousand years in the divinely built city of Jerusalem. Philip Schaff, who's a historian, considered one of the best uh, church historians, says the most striking point in the eschatology, that means the study of end times or end things, last things, of the anti-Nicene, anti that would be before the Nicene Creed, age is the prominent chiliasm, which is the Greek word for a thousand years, and so it's millennialism. That is the belief of a visible reign of Christ in glory on earth with the risen saints for a thousand years before the general resurrection and judgment. I say all that to say that what's going to happen with Augustine is things are going to change. But you need to realize that when we teach premillennialism, then that, is, that was the almost unanimous view of the early church. And they didn't have dispensational premillennialism, which is something I hold to because I also think they did not have a full understanding of God's plan for Israel, but that's another, that's another story. Anyway, so before we jump into Augustine and Gregory the Great and Patrick, and next week we'll look at Bernard de Clairvaux and Francis of Assisi, uh, as we look at all these, I just want to, how do you evaluate the lives of the past? Because there's always going to be a mixed bag here, Okay. Uh, sometimes people wonder, why are you covering Greg the Great? Does it make any sense? Well, because he's had a huge impact on the church history, and there's even things that we can learn from anyone. When you look at anybody's life from the past, you look at your own life, are you going to find some things that are, do not align with the character of Christ? <laughs> the only perfect individual that's ever walked this earth is Jesus Christ. He's the only one that lived a perfect life and had a perfect character. We're to be remade in his image. No matter who you're looking at, whether it's in Scripture or in church history, we're all a mixed bag. And you take any life from the past, there's going to be some things that you can celebrate, some things that you can't. I always say that as we look at these people in the past, there are parts of their lives that are examples to follow. 
There are some parts of their lives that are examples to avoid. And then there's some parts of their life that we simply just have to evaluate. And I think you have to do that with anybody's life. Uh, we live in a cancel culture where people seem to go back, and if there's one part of someone's life that they disagree with, well, that just throw them all away. But that's, that's not even reasonable because if someone did the same thing for our lives, guess what? <laughs> all of us uh, would be canceled. And so an example to evaluate means that, yes, there are some times when they did things that would be considered sinful choices, and we should acknowledge that. David had sinful choices. Um, Abraham, when he lied, had sinful choices. That is a common thing that you have to um, see and avoid. Sometimes they made decisions out of what I would call ignorance. They didn't see the long-term impact of what they were doing. Like I said, if I lived during the time of Constantine, man, I would be wearing the shirts and, and cheering on Constantine. He ended persecution. I probably would not have seen the long-term trajectory of where some of that may have led. And then finally, some of it's weakness. Spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. There are some times when they make decisions and just in the context of their lives, uh, they made the best decision that they could. And then there are some parts I would call spirit-filled because anything we do that's in line with the character of Christ is because the Spirit of God is working in us. I feel like that's something, a, a little bit of a disclaimer, because all of these people that we're going to go over, there's going to be some things that are you probably can commend and celebrate and some things that don't make a lot of sense to you. And just realize that if Christ tarries for a thousand years and someone looks back at your life, they're going to see the exact same thing. Some things that don't make a bit of sense to them and some things that are worthy of following because they match the character of Christ. Okay. Let's talk about Augustine. Now, I sometimes will call him Augustine um, because I grew up near St. Augustine, Florida, and it's very hard for me not to call him Augustine. But I've learned in academic circles that it sounds better to say Augustine. And so if I say Augustine, it's because my old um, Floridian Southern is coming out. And if I say Augustine, then be impressed because that's the academic way to say his name. I call him the theologian great impact, not just in the church, in Western civilization as a whole. He is considered the most influential theologian in church history, um, obviously outside of the Apostle Paul. Jerome, a contemporary, called him the second founder of the faith after the Apostle Paul. Uh, Roger Olson uh, said most theologians define their positions in relation to uh, Augustine's doctrines. It's funny, the uh, Roman Catholics are going to appeal to Augustine, and the Protestants are going to appeal to Augustine. He wrote so much, there was something you probably could get for just about every viewpoint later on in church history. In each of the 16th centuries after his conversion, Augustine has been a major intellectual, spiritual, and cultural force, and that is from a Yale historian. And so you need to understand Augustine because he's had a great impact. You've been influenced by him whether you recognize it or not. He's the author of Confessions. If you've never read Confessions, I highly encourage you to read it. Find a good translation, because there's some that are a little harder to read than others. Confessions is considered the first truly modern autobiography in the history of the world. People just didn't write autobiographies. They would, they would sometimes write about how wonderful they were and how great they were, but someone writing an autobiography that exposed the turmoil in their heart and their struggles against sin... That just didn't happen. People didn't do that. And Augustine wrote Confessions, and it reads like something that you could see today. I mean, his, what he battled in his life is very similar to what people battle today. Uh, when I was uh, in Bible college, one of the books I picked up uh, is called, I don't know if it's still out or not, The Treasury of Christian Spiritual Classics. It's a good one. It has uh, Augustine, Brother Lawrence, Thomas Akempis, and Bernard of Clairvaux, and just some of their writings. But again, online you can probably find a lot of these now anyway. But he's, that's definitely a book worth reading. Um, he developed the just war theory. Ever heard of the just war theory? Uh, Augustine is the one who said, okay, is it okay? Should all Christians be pacifists? Or are there, are there times when we're called uh, to have a war, to go to war? And he developed what's called the just war theory. He said that the objective has to be just, the means have to be just, and ultimately the goal has to be the goal of love. It has to be to rescue people or for the benefit of people. He said that civilian casualties should always be 
uh, minimized, and um, what was the other thing? Clear objective, avoid excesses, avoid civilian casualties. And in many ways, that became something that influenced Western thought on just war theory uh, down through the centuries. And then he authored over 1,000 total works. He wrote, wrote 242 books during his lifetime. Remember, he has no word processor. <laughs> He's not typing. Uh, you're talking about writing with a, a quill and on parchment. I mean, the fact that he wrote that many works and books is just mind-boggling. The man was absolutely brilliant. He lived during the fall of Rome, which we're going to talk about. He lived during the best of times and the worst of times. He saw the church at its highest with it being favored by the Roman Empire, and he also saw the fall of Rome and the impact that that had over time. And so he lived during a very unique time in history. Fall of Rome is going to happen in A.D. 410. It's a very key event in church, I mean, in world history, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But let me keep going. Okay, so here's the Roman Empire again. Remember, you have the Latin-speaking side on the west. You have the Greek-speaking side on the east. Uh, Augustine is born near Carthage in a little town called Tagast. Uh, if I pronounce these things wrong and you know what, how they're pronounced, feel free to interrupt me. I pronounce them, I'm hooked on phonics, so the best way I can say is Tagast. Uh, near Carthage. Carthage is in modern-day Tunisia, so he was born, he's an African, he's born in northern Africa. Am I standing in the way? I'm sorry. Um, and so he is born there in Tagast, and what do we know about his childhood? Well, his mom, Monica, was a very devout believer, uh, prayed for um, Augustine from a very uh, early age. She just is a very devoted, and she's one of the heroes of church history. His dad was Patricius. He was a local Roman official, and as far as we know, he was as pagan as they come. How they ended up together, I don't know, but they were. And so um, Monica is trying to raise him in a Christian way. His dad is just uh, encouraging him in all the wrong ways. As a young child, he was a brat. Um, he was a uncontrollable, uh, the term is used, he had an ungovernable temper. He got in trouble all the time. He liked pranks. Uh, he liked getting in fights. He hated school. He was just too smart for school, and so he would get bored and get himself in trouble. He would do things. He gambled a lot when he was young. Uh, he one time posted signs around uh, his little city about some great uh, speaker coming to town. The speaker was not coming to town, but he thought it was great that everybody assembled on this night for this big event, and nobody shows up. And so that's the kind of person he was. He just loved to create problems and cause uh, issues. But he was very smart, and his dad knew he was very smart. He just had one of those precocious minds. And so his dad raised enough money to send him to a school in a place called Madura, which was down south of Tagast and was uh, considered one of the better schools at that time. His dad could care less about his morals. Um, his dad just wanted him to be successful. He wanted him to just uh, be, uh, 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 honor the family name and be successful. And his dad did not care about his morals at all. Uh, one book on Augustine said, said this, when much later Augustine drew up the balance sheet of his father's behavior, the greatest crime of Patricius was precisely that he allowed the boy to be as immoral as he pleased. In other words, he did not correct him. He did not try to develop character in him. He just wanted him to succeed, uh, make money, and you can just do what, whatever else you want to do. So he sends him off to this school, and here's where he goes to, um, at this school in Madura is when he begins to find out how much he does love books. He loves studying. He loves poetry. And he loves women. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, sure. He loved books, poetry, and sex is basically what he discovered. He's about 12 or 13. He's on his own, and he is just pursuing everything he can. Um, 
All indications are he had his first uh, sexual experience at 12 or 13 years old. At some point early on when he goes to this school, he's never been, um, he's never been restrained in there. In fact, his dad seemed to be very proud of his sexual exploits. And so that is what happens. He goes off. He does super well in school, but he begins to develop this appetite for uh, sexual immorality. In fact, he says this, lust stormed confusingly within me, whirling my thoughtless youth over the precipices of desire. And so I wandered still further from thee, and thou didst leave me to myself, the torrent of my fornications tossed and swelled and boiled and ran over. Um, so he struggled. At the age of 16, he's home back in his hometown in Tagast, and he participates in the famous, the famous pear tree incident, um, which is sort of funny because we, we have lots of pears now. I have, someone was going to bring a pear cobbler or something tonight, so I thought we could all eat pears tonight. But the pear tree incident is he comes home, and he gets together with some friends, and there's a, a neighbor that has a pear tree with just beautiful fruit on it. Obviously, this is something that the man has for his family, possibly to sell. And him and his friends get together in the middle of the night, and they go pick all those pears and just splash them on the roads and throw them all over the place and basically just destroy the whole thing. It, it sounds like a teen prank kind of thing, but Augustine, as he looks back on that, just begins to realize what in the world was going on in my heart. Why would I do that? Why, why would I have any interest? Why is that something that we thought was fun uh, to destroy this guy's uh, pear tree and to destroy his fruit? And he begins to reflect on it. I think I have a... You, this, this is not the best translation, but let me just read what he says. He says, Behold my heart, O God, behold my heart, which thou hast pity upon in the bottom of the bottomless pit, now behold, let my heart tell thee what it sought there. This is at the pear tree. When I should be gratuitously evil, having no temptation to ill, but the ill itself. It was foul, and I loved it. I loved to perish. I loved my own sin. Thy foul soul, falling from thy place to utter destruction, not seeking anything through the shame, but the shame itself. And what he's saying is, I didn't want to do it except for the fact I shouldn't do it. And because I shouldn't do it, I was drawn to do it. And the only thing I was really looking for, I should have been ashamed of it, but actually that's what I pursued is something that was shameful because it was, it was forbidden. And it was something that was contrary to what people uh, wanted me to do. Um, he says later in another spot, let me see if I can find it. Um, And this is when he, when he was uh, at school. He said, My mother commanded me not to commit fornication, and especially that I should not defile any man's wife. This seemed to me no better than women's counsels, which it should be a shame for me to follow. I ran headlong with such blindness that I was ashamed, of my, ashamed among my equals to be guilty of less imp impudence than they were, whom I heard brag mightily of their naughtiness, yea, and so much the more boasting by how much more they had been beastly and I took pleasure to do it, not for the pleasure of the act only, but for the praise of it also. And so he's basically talking about peer pressure among his friends. It was not just doing something wrong. It was being praised by your friends because you were doing something wrong. And as he begins to look back, he realizes, wow, there was something so desperately wrong with my heart. And so that's the famous pear tree incident. His father dies around 370. Augustine's academic life would have come to an abrupt end if it wasn't for the fact a wealthy man in the city, Romanian, noticed Augustine's potential and paid for him to school, attend school in Carthage. Woo now he's going to the big city. This is a Mississippi boy from Yazoo City going to Las Vegas and just seeing all the sights. He's from a small town, and now he's going to the big city. Uh, it says uh, T.S. Eliot wrote a poem where he describes Augustine going to Carthage, and it says, to Carthage I came burning, burning. He had so much lust and everything going on in his heart, and now he's in a place where he can just indulge uh, to, his, to the limit. 
It's a cultured cosmopolitan city with plenty of offerings for a young man looking for pleasure. He fell in love with the theater. He poured his energies into studying Latin, rhetoric, mathematics, music, and philosophy. And he fed his insatiable lust by taking in a concubine, which was sort of um, looked favorably upon back then, fathering a son, a Diodatus, at the age of 18. And so he has a son at age 18. A Diodatus means gift of God. So he has this some sense of a God. He's living a, a life totally contrary to him, but in his mind, uh, when he has this son, he names him gift of God. His life is on an upward swing, but his heart is still restless. He longed to know the truth and understand the purpose of life. He turned to the Bible for answers, but found it too crude and simplistic for his budding young mind. Instead, he turned to Manichaeism. And so um, he fathers his child at the age of 18. Uh, he starts his young adult years, and he's starting to grow a little restless because life is not quite satisfying in the way he, th uh, he thinks it should. And so he turns to the teachings of a guy named Manny. Um, Manny was an Italian guy that owned a pizzeria. Uh, no, just kidding. He was a, from Persia, from the area of Iran, and he basically was a teacher that took Gnostic beliefs and packaged them in a way that appealed to Augustine. He was a self-proclaimed apostle of Christ, and so he was smart enough to use Christianity and, and use the name of Christ to make it look like he... Uh, had some kind of new uh, Christian belief. He was a Gnostic dualist, and so he, he believes the body is bad, and it's only about the spirit, and uh, there's no need for a bodily resurrection. Christ didn't, wasn't truly human, because really it's all about the spirit. And Jesus is a prophet like Buddha that just enlightened us and helped us to understand um, spiritual enlightenment. So his belief denied the body, feed the spirit. Uh, he taught that you really should have no sex, that you should be vegetarian, and you should progress to greater spiritual enlightenment. Augustine is drawn to this, but he has one big problem with uh, Manichaeism. Anybody want to guess what it might be? <laughs> he's, he's thinking, okay, I like this guy, and I like this guy's emphasis on this kind of spiritual thing, but this no sex thing, I don't think I can do. And so he becomes a hearer <laughs> among the Manichaeans, which means he's basically auditing the course. He doesn't have to really pass any tests, but he can, he can learn and still audit and feel like he's uh, doing well. He graduates, he comes back, he's a, he's a master at rhetoric. That's just the ability to speak well. He moves back in with his mom and to gas. Uh, she finds out about his newfound beliefs and his promiscuous lifestyle, so she throws him out of the house. Way to go, Mom. Mom says, you know what? Uh, you come back, and now I'm finding out you have some of these strange beliefs, and you're living this kind of life. Uh, you can't be here. So she throws him out the house. No worry. He goes in with Romanian, who's his, his sponsor, his patron, and he lives a life of luxury. Things are moving along smoothly until... See, now I'm building all this uh, anticipation he returns to, to gas to teach rhetoric at age 21. His best friend dies. Things are going well. Um, he feels like he's got some of his spiritual questions answered. He's still pursuing the, his life that he wants. And then suddenly his best friend dies. And I want to read, uh, this is Christian History Magazine, and this, this is what it says about this. It says this, During this time in Tagas, he was called to the bedside, of a boyhood friend who had suddenly taken ill and was dying. A priest was summoned to the deathbed, and much to the unbelieving Augustine's dismay, the, the priest proceeded to baptize the comatose young man. Augustine had shared with this buddy a disdain for Christianity. Together they had mocked the church, and now without Augustine's friend even knowing it, the priest was trying to drag the lad right into the church's arms. Then the friend miraculously recovered. Later, as Augustine chatted with his friend, he began joking about this bogus baptism. But the friend became very serious. It was no laughing matter. He indicated the baptism had been real. His friend's change of attitude shook Augustine, but he was even more shaken when the friend suddenly died two weeks later. As he recounted it later in the Confessions, this seemed to mark the beginning of a reappraisal in Augustine's heart and mind. And I just, this sentence hits me. He could laugh at Christianity but he was dumb in the face of death. <laughs> he could mock Christianity left and right, but as he was suddenly confronted with the reality of death as one of his young 20-year-old friends died, 
suddenly he realized he didn't have an answer for that. And his friend's conversion really shook him because he began to realize, wait a second, we mocked this thing together, and now he changes, now he dies, and it just made Augustine start to reevaluate what he thought. So he returns to Carthage to teach uh, rhetoric, and so he goes to this guy named Faust, uh, Faustus, who was the, the big Manichaean, and he goes to him hoping that this man will give him some answers, because now death has sort of created some questions in his mind. He goes to this guy who's the top Manichaean in the, in the region, and he finds that this guy can talk eloquently, he sounds really flowery, but he really has no answers, and Augustine's smart enough to realize there's no answers there, and so he sort of starts to move away from his Manichaeism, but he still has on this rise where he wants to uh, reach the pinnacle of his career. And so he decides he needs to move to Rome. Uh, Rome's the centerpiece. If he can make it in Rome, he can make it anywhere. Um, if you can make it there, what, how's that song go? Uh, New York, New York. So it's like going from New Orleans to New York, and so if he can make it there, he's going to be on the upward spiral. Oh, he's disappointed in his meeting with Faustus. He moves to Rome to further his career. His mom begs him not to go. She says, Augustine, do not go. It's not going to be good for you. Uh, you're not ready for this. And he says, you're right, Mom. I'm not going to go. And then in the middle of the night, he gets on a boat, and he takes off to Rome. So he lied to Mama uh, and did what he wanted to do. He's appointed professor of rhetoric in Milan. He gets to Rome. And when he gets to Rome, he quickly distinguishes himself. It's obvious this man is brilliant and he speaks well. He catches the attention of a guy named Symmachus. Symmachus is a senator who really wants to restore the pagan religion back into Rome. And he sees in Augustine someone that he thinks he can use to his advantage. The emperor at this time is a young child, basically, who lives in Milan. And so Symmachus sends Augustine to Milan to be the teacher of rhetoric hoping that he can use Augustine to sort of become friends with this young emperor and begin to shift him and change him more into uh, giving preference to pagan belief. And so that's how he ends up in Milan. In Milan, he, he grows an interest in a guy named Ambrose. Ambrose is key in church history as well. We could spend a whole lot of time uh, talking about Ambrose. Um, but he begins to be impacted by Ambrose. He goes to church to listen to Ambrose because Ambrose is, you know, he's a teacher of rhetoric. He loves seeing how Ambrose teaches, and so he goes to just watch how he speaks, but the more he's hearing him speak, the more he's being drawn to what he is saying as well. Meanwhile, his mom um, moves to Milan to join him, and she says, it's time for you to end this concubine relationship. He's been in a 13-year relationship with this unnamed woman, probably from the lower classes, uh, probably someone that would not have been good for his career advancement, but was good for sexual pleasure. And his mom says, you need to stop that relationship. You need to get into a marriage. And so he agrees, and he is engaged to someone. The only rule is he needs to remain chaste for two years. <laughs> well, that didn't work. And so um, he is finally at a place and I think this is key. He realizes he's a master of rhetoric, but he's a slave to sexual lust. He thinks he's in control, but he realizes he has these desires and lusts that he cannot control. They just keep cropping up in his life, and he tries to fight them, and they just keep bringing him back under slavery. So he soon has become, after he goes and listens to Ambrose, and he begins to hear uh, Ambrose describe the Christian belief, and it, he does it in a way that Augustine has never heard, he suddenly comes to the place where he recognizes that Christianity is true. He knows Christianity is true, but he has a hard time converting, and why would that be? He's impressed with the teaching of Ambrose. He wants to convert, but he loves sin. <laughs> Uh, he knows that if he converts, he's going to have to change his ways, and he just simply doesn't want to do it. If you've ever read the testimony of Kerry Livgren, uh, he's the singer for Kansas that wrote Dust in the Wind, and Jeff Pollard, who was a youth pastor here, uh, was, uh, also had a band, LaRue. They were on tour together. Jeff Pollard convinced Kerry Livgren uh, on this bus trip that Christianity was true, but Kerry Livgren says, at the end of the bus trip, I knew Christianity was true, but I didn't convert because I didn't want to. 
it was going to change everything in my life, and I simply didn't want to change. And so just because uh, you're convinced Christianity is true doesn't mean you're going to change because sometimes you simply don't want to. You still enjoy the life that you're living, and you assume that Christianity is going to change all that. Here's his famous confession. Give me chastity and continency, only not yet. <laughs> Give me purity, Lord, but not yet. You know, wait, wait a little bit longer. I still want to live my life. Finally, one day, he's in the garden. He's struggling. He's got this war going on in his heart. He knows Christianity is true. He knows he needs to believe, but he has this pull towards sin, and he describes it in such graphic ways. He talks about as he's struggling that he hears the voices of all of his um, mistresses in his past speaking in his ears, um, and they say, the very toys of toys, the vanity of vanities, my ancient mistresses still held me. They plucked my fleshly garment and whispered softly, do you cast us off? <laughs> Can you really get rid of us, Augustine? Uh, he's soul sick. He's tormented. He doesn't know what to do. He finally, uh, he's talking with a friend in the garden. He finally leaves his friend, and he just goes off by himself, and he's struggling knowing how do I reconcile this? I know this is true, but I just can't give up. I can't repent and trust in Christ. Finally, as he gets to the corner of his garden, he hears next door a bunch of kids playing, and they're shouting over and over, tole lege, tole lege, tole lege, tole lege. He has no idea what the game is. He's never heard of this game, but what that means is pick it up and read, pick it up and read, pick it up and read. Finally, he takes that to be a message from God that he needs to go and pick up a Bible and read it. And so he goes and picks up a Bible, and he opens it up to the first place that it goes to. I don't recommend this. This is not good Bible study methods, but God can use just about anything. He opens it up, and it lands on Romans 13, 13 through 14. Here's what he reads. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in licentiousness and lewdness, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Not your typical evangelistic passage, but the words that hit him were, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He was trying to fight this in his own strength, and he could not understand how he could ever be delivered, and that passage hit him, and it told him, you just need to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will give you the power to live a life that you don't feel like you're capable of living. And so he converts. He becomes a believer, and the world would never be the same. So now let's talk about his new man. Uh, he goes off on a little retreat with his friends. He solidifies his beliefs. He writes a few books. You know, that's what you do when you go on a retreat, just write a few books. He wins his son to the, to the Lord and many of his friends to Christ. Of course, he tells his mom. His mom is thrilled that he finally has chosen to follow Christ. Seven months later, he returns to Milan. He quits his job, and on Easter Sunday, 387, he and his son are baptized by Ambrose. A huge... Um, earth-shattering event in that time period. His dream is to set up a monastic retreat. His dream is to get a bunch of his buddies, let's go off somewhere in the, in the country, in the woods, almost like uh, a monastery. Let's just write books. Let's philosophize. Let's talk about life. Let's just, you know, just enter into this um, just amazing intellectual, philosophical uh, world where we can just explore all the ideas uh, of our newfound faith. And so that's his goal. Uh, he's baptized on Easter Sunday. Oh, on the way to go back to his hometown area where he wants to set up this retreat, his mother dies. Um, he heads back to his hometown of Tagast. On the way, he encounters several setbacks. First, his ship is detained near Rome, and second, his mother died. Um, that was a huge, unexpected thing in his life. And if you look in your study guide uh, to page 84... Did anybody read some of those excerpts from Augustine's Confessions, by the way? One person? That's good. Good. Two people. Good. It's worth reading that. Hopefully it will give you a little bit of a... But look on page 84. His mom dies. Uh, he buries her. And if you read the parts before this, 
he doesn't he can't cry he 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 feels this strange emotion and he's fighting back his tears and he he doesn't quite know what to do with his emotions he just his mom has died she was so faithful to him he doesn't he doesn't know how to respond and he's he just sort of is walking around in this daze. And then finally it says this on page 84. And then little by little there came back to me my former memories of thy handmaid, her devout life toward thee, her holy tenderness and attentiveness toward us, which had suddenly been taken away from me. And it was a solace for me to weep in thy sight for her and for myself, about her and about myself. Thus I set free the tears which before I repressed, that they might flow at will, spreading them out as a pillow beneath my heart. And it rested on them, for thy ears were near to me, not those of a man who would have been a, made a scornful comment about my weeping. So he basically just lets his emotions just finally uh, loose. Then he says this, Let none sever her, my mother, from your protection. Let neither the lion nor the dragon interpose himself by force or fraud, for she will not answer that she, uh, she owes nothing, lest she be convicted and seized by the crafty accuser. But she will answer that her sins are forgiven by him, the one to whom no one can repay the price, which he who owed nothing paid for us. May she rest then in peace with her only husband, whom she obeyed with patience, bringing forth fruit unto you, that she might win him also unto you. And inspire, O Lord my God, inspire your servants, my brothers, your sons, my masters, whom with voice and heart I pen, I serve, that so many may read these confessions and may at your altar remember Monica, your handmaid with Patricius, her sometimes husband, through whom you gave me life, how I know not. And so he honors his mom, and really his confessions is just an honor to his mom who never stopped praying for him. Apparently his mom, when she was so distraught with the choices that Augustine was making, went to her bishop, and she just begged her bishop, please do something, please do something. Uh, my boy, you know, he just is, he's getting into all kinds of issues. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And she's weeping and weeping in front of this bishop. And the bishop finally says to her, uh, go in peace. The son of these tears will not perish. And what he meant is the passion you have and the tears you have for your son, I can assure you, um, God is going to answer. Um, I can't always say that's necessarily true, but this bishop felt like her tears and her passion for her son eventually uh, God was going to answer, and he did. He faced tragedy after tragedy after conversion. His mom dies. Then his son unexpectedly dies. Then another friend dies. And so after his conversion, life didn't get easy. In fact, he was confronted with tragedy after tragedy. But he continued to grow in his faith. Uh, he begins writing. He gets to this little retreat. He begins writing. Life is wonderful. It's great. And then if you look on page 20, uh, he eventually visits the city of Hippo, the big city of Hippo, yes, um, and has a big calling. He, he goes to Hippo to convince a friend who lives in the city to join his monastery. He's starting this little commune of philosophers and theologians. They're just going to write books and defend Christianity, and he's so excited about this. So he's going to convince his friend to join this monastery. Well, he gets to the church, and Valerius is the bishop of this church, and he looks out, and he sees Augustine come in and sit in his church. And he's already, Augustine's already made a name for himself. He's just a brilliant man with a brilliant mind. And so Valerius changes his sermon topic that day on the spot, and he begins to preach on God's great need for servants in his church. And so he says, you know, we need men. We need men who are smart and men who understand theology to serve in God's church and to strengthen the church. And we need men who, who are able to write and able to defend Christianity. He goes on and on about this great need. And everybody starts looking at Augustine because they know who he is. They've seen him on TV. They probably read some of his books. And suddenly at the end of the service, everyone gathers around him and they appoint him as their priest. And it says that Augustine starts to weep. And they think, it's okay, it's okay. I know you're just a priest, but you'll be bishop one day. Not realizing that he is weeping because he realizes that God is changing his plans. He did not want to be a pastor. He did not want to do this. And yet God called him. And he became, eventually Valerius dies and Augustine becomes the pastor of this church for 34 years. 
and he is a faithful pastor. Uh, he serves not only as the leader of the church, but a trainer of men, and he makes a huge impact uh, as a pastor and in the church. How am I doing on time? Okay, I got five more minutes. Let me just read what kind of pastor he was uh, when he preached. Remember, he's a, he's a world-class speaker. Um, he's incredible. But when it came to being a pastor, I think being a, being a pastor helped him develop a lot more just common sense and just a real love for people. And here's how it describes his pastoring. With his training and rhetoric, Augustine was not entirely out of place in a court of law, but he felt most at home in the pulpit. His relationship with his congregation was remarkable. His conversational style was laced with questions tossed to his listeners, and he frequently elicited applause or some vocal response from them, such as woo-hoo. No, just kidding. <laughs> Um, but he tried to get them involved. Uh, sensitivity trumped classical structure. Augustine, who always used we when addressing his listeners, said, it is better that we should be understood by you than be artists in speech and talk past you. Though many of Augustine's sermons were preserved, they were transcribed from his speaking, not written beforehand. He spoke from rough notes at most, and sometimes not even those. If the lector accidentally read the wrong scripture, Augustine was known to ignore his prepared message and speak extemporaneously instead. He said this, In these circumstances, I prefer to conform to the error of the lector and the will of God rather than to follow my own, he said. He always watched for tangible evidence of the power of the living word in his audience. He knew he had touched hearts when he saw tears. If they seemed bored, he might quickly change subjects or stop speaking altogether. And some of you are thinking, oh, if only Pastor Steve would do that. <laughs> but I love the fact that he interacted with his people. He wanted them involved. He tried to elicit response. He was not trying to speak over them. He was trying to engage them in understanding the truth. Uh, he wrote a bunch of books. <laughs> As you can see, 242 before he died. That's averaging about five and a half books per year, which, again, is just mind-boggling to me. He wrote Confessions, which I think is great to read. City of God, I know Pastor Jim had to read that. I've never read it. It's 1,500 pages. Um, I've read summaries of it, the cliff notes, and that's good enough for me. But that's after the Roman Empire fell, and the world is trying to process this, and he is writing, there's the city of man, and there's the city of God, and God's city is not going to fail. This is where he comes up with just war theory. It's also where amillennialism begins to take shape. He wrote a book on the nature, uh, on nature and grace. Uh, there's a guy named Pelagius that said, basically, we're not really that bad. We're sort of born neutral, and we can do good on our own. And Augustine just said, no, that's not true. And he came up with this famous uh, syllogism, I guess. I don't know what, what the word is. He said Adam was able to sin. Adam was created innocent, and he had free choice, and he was able to sin, and Adam chose to sin. Because Adam chose to sin, all of us who are children of Adam are unable not to sin. We have a heart that is just bent inward and bent towards self, and so uh, we're always going to make choices that are really selfish in their nature. When I become a believer, I'm able not to sin. Now, through the power of the Spirit, I don't have to live a life of sin. I still can sin, but I now have the ability to live a different kind of life, and then when I finally make it to heaven, I'll be unable to to sin. And that little, uh, little process just helped people to understand just the reality of who we are before Christ, who we are after Christ, and the hope that we have in heaven. He wrote on the good of marriage. This was a defense of marriage. The problem is uh, Augustine, who lived such a promiscuous life, had a hard time having a a good view of sexual intimacy. He just never experienced uh, a pure kind of sexual intimacy. All that he knew was through the concubine, through his liaison, all that uh, stuff that he did um, sinfully. And so though he defended marriage, he had a very low view of sexual intimacy. He basically said celibacy is what God really desires for everyone. That's the true highest goal if you're married, uh, if you can be celibate in your marriage, well, that's probably the best you can do in your situation. If you have to have sexual intimacy, it should only be for procreation. That's the only legitimate reason to have sexual intimacy. If you have sexual intimacy for pleasure, well, it's technically sort of sinful, it's a, but it's a forgivable fault. It's something that God sort of overlooks because of your inability 
to um, re not remain sexually pure. And sexual morality, of course, is almost an unforgivable, or not unforgivable, it's just a, a serious sin. Because of his past, and because of his reaction to his past, his views on sexual intimacy and celibacy are going to impact the church for the next 1,200 years. Um, isn't it interesting? Sometimes our past, uh, you know, I, I've known people who came from a very uh, wild past, and when they become parents, they just lock down their kids, and my kids are never going to do anything. And, I, and uh, they swing the pendulum too far, and it creates uh, problems on the other side. And Augustine did that. He swung the pendulum so far that now that's going to impact the way uh, Christian theology is going to look at sexual intimacy and celibacy is going to become this like, um, you know, you could argue that maybe we sw swung too far this way and now we think everyone should get married and we don't talk about celibate singleness. But back then, celibate singleness was the, you were the top dogs, you were the spiritual heroes and everyone else, well, you know, uh, you just will never make it to the, top ranks, but you can do your best and possibly even be celibate in marriage, and that might be good enough. So that's going to have a big impact on, uh, his, on Christian theology. Christian doctrine, he writes a summary of doctrine. He writes a practical handbook on Christian living. Then at the end of his life, before he dies, he writes retractions. <laughs> I think that's awesome. Um, he gets to the end of his life, and you know, imagine if you've written 242 books over your lifetime. He starts going back and says, oh, I really didn't mean that. Oh, I, my view has changed on that. Oh, yeah, I would probably explain that differently. Uh, he never finished it, but he was trying to go back and say, hey, don't take everything I've said because some things were, I'm not necessarily still agree with. Three lessons from his life before we take a break. No one is beyond the reach of God. Praise God. Augustine did not look like a man. He was on an upward success ladder. He had uh, sexual lust issues. He was challenged. He mocked Christianity for most of his early life, and yet God uh, turned him around, almost like the apostle Paul. Second thing, no one is above the power of sin. You know, Augustine had every degree you could possibly have, uh, he was educated, he was considered successful, he was a master at rhetoric, and yet he was a slave to his own sexual lust. And all of us, no matter how great you think you are, or how many degrees you have, or how intellectual you are, or philosophical you are, there is something in our lives that we just cannot overcome sin in our own strength. And then finally, no job is higher than serving Christ. From a worldly standard, he was heading to the top, and he gave all of that up to become a simple pastor in a podunk town. And for him, that was the highest calling he could have. What's interesting, this is just a unique twist of history. He was the teacher of rhetoric in Milan, sent there by a guy named Symmachus to have influence on the young emperor. That young emperor dies, and the person that ends up becoming the emperor is the guy who held the position that Augustine gave up. His name was Eugenius, and Symmachus, when this emperor dies, makes Eugenius, who had Augustine's um, role, he nominates him or, or works the powers that be, and that man becomes the emperor. So if Augustine would have stayed in his position uh, as the teacher of rhetoric, Symmachus's plan was if the opportunity ever opened up, he was destined to be the emperor of Rome. From a human standpoint, it was like, man, you gave up that to be a pastor in a podunk town called Hippo? I mean, what a... But you know what? Eugenius ends up getting killed about four years later because, you know, that's what happens to Roman emperors. They just get killed. He ate a <laughs> mushroom pizza. I don't know. <laughs> he dies. And here we are, 1,600 years later, you have no idea who Eugenius II is, but Augustine has changed the trajectory of the world. And so I would say whatever God calls you to, uh, no matter what it looks like, God can use it to change the world if you're doing it for his glory. Let me stop there. Uh, let's take a break, and we will pick up on the fall of Rome, and then hopefully move through Gregory the Great and Patrick fast enough that we'll have time for questions. Uh, let's start. We're on page 21, talking about the fall of the empire. 
410 is a key date. That's the fall of Rome. Again, uh, you see this map that I'm going to put up a lot, so just uh, memorize it and you'll be fine. That's the Roman Empire. Is that the only people that were alive during that time? No, there's a bunch of barbarians. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Conan, all those live up here in this area. Uh, you have groups, I mean, some of these are great names. Vandals, the Franks, the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, and the Huns. And over time, the Roman Empire just begins to start collapsing in on, ourse- on itself. And these uh, barbarian tribes, and the reason they were called barbarians is because their, their language sounded like a bunch of bar, 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 bar. They didn't know what they were. But actually, some of these had become very advanced. And because they were becoming more advanced, they were actually starting to uh, conquer some of the Roman Empire. The Visigoths start on this path, and they just, let's go pillage. You know, one morning they woke up, hey, let's go pillage some cities and cause some uh, chaos. So they go down into the eastern side, uh, into that area of Greece. Then they head up the coast. And then they said, hey, let's go to Rome and cause some problems. And so they get to Rome in 410. Their leader is a guy named uh, Alaric, I think is how you say it. They get to Rome, and they uh, put a siege on Rome. Somehow the walls are, um, uh, they, what is that word? Man, I'm having a, breached. Breached, the walls were breached, and the next thing you know, Rome is being invaded by a bunch of these barbarians. Um, here's one of the, oh, and then after they destroyed Rome, they kept pillaging and going on until they got eventually to Spain. I thought I had a picture. Oh, so Rome, uh, here's the motto of the Roman Empire or of the city of Rome, unconquerable eternal Rome, Uh, Roma Eterne. It was on their coins, I would say that's not smart to put that on your coins because God just has a way of saying, oh, if you think you're unconquerable and eternal, I'll show you that you're not. And sure enough, uh, Rome falls in 410 with Alaric and the Visigoths. Um, I don't think this is what it looked like. Um, This looks like a motorcycle gang at a debutante's ball, basically. (laughs) I mean, if you look at this guy in the middle, I mean, he looks like, the biggest caveman you'd ever see. And then all the Romans are all in their white and they're, you know, they just got back from the, from the tea time or something, uh, high tea. And that's probably not an accurate picture, but it gives you a sense of how it was portrayed back then uh, with the fall of Rome. That sends shock waves through the world. Uh, you have to understand that people would not ever assume that Rome would fall, and yet here it is, and it had fallen, the city of Rome, the great city uh, of the Roman Empire. Um, Again, when we talk about the fall of Rome, just remember that what we're saying is not that the whole Roman Empire fell. The eastern side is going to continue basically for another thousand years. That's the Byzantine Empire, and that's going to continue to go. It's going to be weakened, and it's going to have its own problems uh, until the Ottoman Turks eventually conquer it. But for the most part, it's going to continue on. Meanwhile, the western side, the Latin side, suddenly gets divided among all these barbarian tribes. And you're going to end up with Germany and France and Belgium and all Hungary. All the nations we know now are going to be an assortment of some of these barbarian tribes. And so you probably are descended from a barbarian somewhere down the line. Uh, The big question, why did Rome fall? Uh, Edward Gibbon wrote a classic talking about that. There's actually, and if you read all the histories of Rome, there's about 200 reasons why people give why Rome fell. I'll give you some of the major ones. First of all, the capital was moved to Constantinople. Remember that the capital under Constantine was basically moved over to the eastern side. And so Rome, though, was still considered one of the major cities but it's, it's losing some of its luster, and so because of that, it, it weakened Rome as a city. Germanization of the military. Nobody wanted to serve in the military anymore. They just wanted to, uh, they enjoyed their peace, they enjoyed their prosperity, and so they began to hire uh, 
barbarian mercenaries to serve in their army to fight off the barbarians. And so, obviously, morale began to change in the military. The rising power of barbarians, you know, they call them barbarians, but one of the biggest inventions that happened in this part of these nations was the invention of the horseshoe. And once they invented the horseshoe, it gave them the ability to ride horses for a lot longer than they ever did, and that gave them the ability to pillage and and to do some of the damage that they did. So they were not, uh, these were not stupid people. They were people who were advancing as well. Prosperity bred complacency. Uh, They enjoyed all the benefits of Rome, but nobody really wanted to work anymore or do anything that helped the empire as a whole to grow. They just sort of enjoyed all the blessings that they had without any responsibility. Hmm. Anyway. Economic decline with high taxes. Uh, The economy began to collapse in on itself. This was an expansive empire that was constantly expanding and expanding and innovating. And eventually, as they had this massive infrastructure, but they did not have a whole lot of productivity, the only way they could make money was keep taxing people and raising their taxes and raising their taxes to maintain an infrastructure that was tottering on collapse. Huh. That's interesting, too. Uh, and some people blame Christianity because Christianity sort of changed. Uh, they, uh, Edward Gibbon sort of blames Christianity. He said the empire was spending more money building churches than they were sort of uh, focused on the military and that uh, Christianity sort of weakened the military because some people were unwilling to do some of the things that the Roman Empire did in the past. There's probably some part of that that's good and some part of that that's... Um, just not true. But anyway, those are some of the reasons for Rome's fall. Um, One of the followers, disciples of Augustine, thought there might be another reason for the fall, and he actually said maybe it was God's sovereignty. And I love this quote. Here's what he says. If only to this end have the barbarians been set within Roman borders, that the church of Christ might be filled with Huns and Suavi, with Vandals and Burgundians, with diverse and innumerable peoples of believers, then let God's mercy be praised, even if this has taken place through our own destruction. In other words, he's saying, if God in his sovereignty said, you know what, it's time for this nation to fall because I want all of these people to be exposed to the gospel and by them invading in this area, they are being exposed to the gospel. And he said, if that's the only reason, then praise God. Because these nations now, these barbarians, many of them are going to end up being exposed to the gospel and trusting Christ. And that's where we get Western civilization and the, the impact that Christianity had on these people. And so that's um, interesting perspective. I call this the age of power. It's going to begin with a guy named Gregory the Great, who we're about to talk, to, talk about. Uh, Next week, we're going to look at the rise of Islam, which is going to happen about this time. That's uh, Muhammad's flight to Medina is in 622, which is considered the start of Islam, and that's obviously going to change the face of church history. Uh, 800 is when Charlemagne is crowned the Holy uh, Holy Roman Emperor, and that's the beginning of what we call the Holy Roman Empire, which many people have facetiously said it wasn't holy, it wasn't Roman anymore, and it wasn't much of an empire, but that's what we call it. 1054 is going to be the split between the East and the West. Next week I'll talk about Eastern Orthodoxy, which developed in the same uh, channel as Roman Catholicism until 1054, when uh, the Roman Pope excommunicated the Patriarch of the East and the Patriarch of the East excommunicated the Pope of the West. And that um, became a split that I think was actually reconciled technically, I guess, 40, I don't know how long ago it was. There was some big news story that I'll have an article about how they sort of uh, revoked their excommunication uh, like a thousand years later. But anyway, uh, the Crusades are going to take place 1095 and continue on for almost 200 years. That's going to change the face of Europe. It's going to change the relationships with uh, the Islamic countries. Um, There's going to be some short victories, but in the end, it's going to probably create more damage than good. And then this age of power is going to end in 1517 with Martin Luther nailing the 95 Theses on the door of Wittenberg. Woohoo! So anyway, uh, that's sort of the span, about a thousand years that we're going to cover over the next few weeks. 
and it's this is going to be the medieval church uh, period where there's going to be some things that are good and some things that are not so good that we'll talk about. Let me talk about Gregory the Great. He is considered uh, by many historians, this would not be necessarily Catholic historians, but historians that look at the development of medieval Catholicism will a lot of times identify Gregory the Great as the man who basically set medieval Catholicism on the trajectory that it eventually went on. Um, why is he so important? Well, first of all, he's laid the foundation for medieval Catholicism. Um, Gregory the Great, it's an article written by F.H. Uh, Duden or Dudden, insofar as the modern Catholic system is a legitimate development of medieval Catholicism, Gregory may not unreasonably be termed the father. Almost all the leading principles of later Catholicism are found in germ in Gregory the Great. Uh, the Dictionary of Christian Biography says the pontificate of Gregory the Great is re rightly regarded as second to none in its influence on the future form of Western Christianity. He's going to really be the one who begins to develop the Catholic doctrines of penance and purgatory. Um, there's going to be elements of it before this time, but he's really the one that's going to systematize it and make it really a key part of Catholicism. Uh, he's going to be instrumental in the spread of the gospel in England. He is credited with bringing the gospel to England. Uh, there's this long story about how he sees these English youths um, in the slave market, and he asks, uh, who are these people? And they say, well, they come from a, uh, an area in Britain. He says, are they believers? They say, no, they're pagans. Uh, he says, what are they called? They say they're called angles. And he misunderstands it and thinks that they say angels, or he says, oh, surely they are angels, and they need uh, the gospel, or God has ordained them to get saved. And so he's the one that's going to send missionaries uh, to the area of Britain and England and, and lead to the conversion. If you're Anglo-Saxon in background, then Gregory the Great is one who is going to be sending uh, missionaries to share the gospel, at least as he understood the gospel. He's considered by some as the first pope. Uh, obviously, Roman, Catholic, Roman Catholics would disagree, and they would say that Peter was the first pope, but really you see, the again, the power of Gregory the Great is going to be um, key in the development of the uh, papal system in the West. I'm going to talk about this a little bit next week, but just, again, I want you to envision what's going to happen. When the East and the West fall, there were five major cities that were key in Christianity. Uh, you had the church at Antioch, you had the church at Jerusalem, you had the church at Constantinople, you had the church of Alexandria, you had the Church of Rome. Those five bishops, those were the largest churches and considered some of the most prestigious bishop uh, positions in the early church. And because they were so prestigious, what those leaders said just carried a lot of weight, either because the church was ancient or because the church was large. Of those five, how many of them are on the west Alexandria, Antioch, Jerusalem, uh, Constantinople, and Rome. One. One. Rome. So what you're going to have is when the empire falls and east and west become separate, on the western side you have one bishop who stands above all the others, the bishop of Rome. And so the western side is going to develop a papacy where the bishop of Rome becomes the head of the church. Eastern side, you have four bishops, and you're going to develop what's called a patriarch system, where if you're part of Eastern Orthodoxy, you're going to have patriarchs who are key leaders of certain cities, and they're going to reject the concept of a universal bishop on the Western side, because in many ways they're saying, who gave you that right <laughs> to become the universal bishop? We all have a say in this. And so you're going to see that split starting to develop as East and West west splits how did the roman bishop become so powerful i mean if rome falls you think how does the bishop become such a key figure on the western side well think about it if the whole governmental system collapses and the only system that is still organized and has power is the church 
guess who's going to start filling in the vacuum of the, the power vacuum? The church. You're going to see this happen about, uh, do I put a date on there? 452, Attila the Hun. Y'all ever heard of him? Yeah, you know, he's one that ate live people and drank blood. I don't know. I, he just has that name that just sounds like he was a, a bad dude. He invades Italy. He was called the scourge of God. He is pillaging. He's destroying. He gets to the edge of Rome, and Rome is ill-prepared. Rome, it can't defend itself. Rome is still in disarray. Here comes Attila the Hun. He wants to just pile on and continue to destroy Rome. Nobody knows what to do. There's really not much of an army, and it just looks like Attila is going to come in and wipe out Rome. Leo uh, the Great is the bishop of Rome at the time, and he has this thought, I'm just going to ride out and meet him there before he gets to the city. He rides out to meet Attila the Hun. No one knows exactly what the conversation was, but Attila the Hun uh, gets up, gets on his horse, and turns around and leaves. And a few days later, he ends up dying. Um, the story, or the common story is, Attila the Hun, as he, he sees the Bishop of Rome coming out, he sees the armies of God behind him, and he sees these angels, uh, I guess that's Michael and Gabriel maybe, flying above him, and he decides, uh, I'm going to turn around. It's a good story. I don't know if that's what he saw or not. I don't know if Leo said, hey, buddy, if you leave, I'll slip you some $100 bills. I don't know what he did. But historically, Attila the Hun had every ability to destroy Rome, and the only one who defended it was Leo, and Leo became known as Leo the Great, and his power just rose in the city of Rome. And so that gives you a sense of what's happened. There's a power vacuum. Uh, no one wants to be a leader in the civil part of Rome, and the only leadership that is there are those who are in the church. And so the church begins to rise in its power and actually begins to dominate the state. Uh, again, I'll probably go over this next week, but you have this church-state kind of uh, dynamic that's going to happen. Uh, in the early church, you have the state just trying to crush the church. That's the early church uh, persecution. Then when Constantine comes along, you basically have the church and state united that's the imperial church. And then the church of power comes, and guess who ends up on top? The church starts dominating the state, and that's what begins to happen in this time period, and it continues to increase. And I'll talk a little bit about that development next week. So Rome's in a lot of problems. It just seems to keep coming into big problems. Uh, 568, they're, they're invaded by the Lombards. 590, they're under siege. There's famines, there's epidemics. It's just nobody wants to lead this mess because the whole city just has problem after problem. Then there's this guy named Gregory. He's born to a fairly wealthy family. He is brilliant. He's considered second to none in grammar and rhetoric and logic. Uh, he does become a prefect, which would be a civil kind of leader in Rome at the age of 33 due to his obvious skills, and actually nobody else wants the job. And so he takes on that role. Sometime around 575, his dad dies, leaves him considerable wealth. Gregory decides to quit his public service, use his father's money to build a bunch of monasteries, and he has sort of the same dream of Augustine. He just sort of wants to get into a monastery, get away from the craziness of the world, and just study and um, uh, to spend his time just thinking about the greatness of God and leading other people into that kind of community. Um, he is so distinguished in his discipline. He's a man of discipline, rigorous asceticism. He denied himself. Uh, eventually, he's going to have stomach problems the rest of his life. That seems to be the case with a lot of these monks. They just, they so abuse their body that later on, they just have all kinds of uh, issues with their body. He was one of those. The Pope at that time... Uh, Let me be careful what I say at this point. Um, the Pope at this time appoints him to go to, uh, to Constantinople as one of his representatives. 
Remember, uh, there, the Constantinople is where the emperor is, and there still tries to be some kind of relationship there. He sends Gregory over there. Gregory really didn't want to go. It, it disrupts his mon monastic kind of life, which he enjoys. But he goes because the Pope tells him to go. He gets over there. He's not impressed with Constantinople. He's not impressed with the emperor. Uh, he doesn't like being there. He hates the Greek language. He just wants to get out of there. And finally, when he's able to come back, it just convinces him, you know what, uh, whatever else I know, I know this, we're not going to get any help from those guys. So if we're going to make it over here, we're going to have to do it on our own. We can't trust the Eastern Empire to rescue us. And so that gives him this sense that the West is really on its own. He returns to Rome. He becomes a leader of the monastery. In 590, the Pope dies, and the clergy and the people get together, and they unanimously elect Gregory to be the next Pope. And Gregory says, no, I do not want that role. That's not what I want. I want to just stay doing what I'm doing. But the people unanimously agree. That has to be approved by the emperor over in Constantinople. So Gregory quickly writes a letter and says, whatever you do, don't approve this. But somehow the letter never makes it there. Gregory realizes that they're about to make him pope, so he runs into the woods and hides <laughs> because he doesn't want any part of this. They eventually find him, they bring him back, and they make him uh, the pope. You see this a lot with Augustine and others. Back then, the idea was if they appoint you to something, it must be God's will, and so you just accept it, and that's sort of what happens with Gregory. He becomes the pope, and immediately he pours himself into it. He decides, okay, if this is my role, I'm going to start cleaning house, and he does. He's actually a very good leader. Um, here's what it says. Uh, if you look under his papacy, it says he negotiated a truce with the Lombards. He cleaned up the city of Rome. He organized food distribution to the needy. He eliminated debt and financial mismanagement among the churches. He restored discipline and morality to the clergy. He instituted changes in the Roman liturgy. He sent out missionaries to pagan lands, being where the Angles and Saxons are, wrote several books which aimed to synthesize the teachings of the early church fathers. They said the man never rested. Uh, he had an engineer's mind, and so he wrote rule books on just about everything. He just, he loved to systematize things. He really did not have any original thoughts. <laughs> I don't mean that in a bad way. What he was good at, he was not really a theologian. He was not trained in that. That was not his thing. He was a man of action. He was an engineer in his mind. And so his greatest thought was, I just need to take what all the church fathers have taught and try to systematize it. And if there's not enough information on something, I want to come up with some kind of system to make sense of it. Uh, so the question is, you know, particularly after baptism, what do you do if you sin? There was not really clear on how do you, uh, how do you get right before God? You know, if you, if you trust in him and you're baptized and then you sin later, what are you supposed to do? Well, Gregory says, you know what? I need to come up with some kind of step-by-step -step process to help people to know that after they sin, what they're supposed to do to get forgiveness. So he's the one that comes up with this concept of penance. Uh, you are sorry, contrition, you confess to someone, uh, the priest, uh, there's some kind of punishment, some kind of thing you have to do, and then the priest uh, pronounces you ab absolved. In his mind, that, that takes all the guesswork out of it, it's very clear what you do, and it's going to make everybody feel a whole lot better. Oh, by the way, I guess I, I forget about my slides. There's Attila the Hun. I mean, he was a great guy. He uh, has a bunch of skulls. That's actually his face on a coin, so he was an ugly dude. Um, and that's who Leo sort of um, uh, caused to leave. Anyway, he helped establish the supremacy of the Bishop of Rome. It's interesting, he rejected the concept of a universal bishop, but because he was such a leader, eventually he began to elevate the supremacy of the Bishop of Rome. Here's actually what he said in one of his letters. Now, I confidently say that whosoever calls himself or desires to be called universal priest is in his elation the precursor of Antichrist because he proudly puts himself above all others, nor is it by dissimilar pride that he is led into error. For as that perverse one wishes to appear as God above all men, so whosoever this one is who covets being called sole priest, he extols himself above all other priests. 
And so he never necessarily intended to be pictured as a universal bishop, but his leadership was so strong that eventually he sort of took on that kind of role. Uh, he developed the concept of tenets, which I said really comes from his organized mind, and he's trying to make it simple on how a person finds uh, this sense of uh, absolving of guilt after they have sinned. He's going to be the one that develops really the thoughts of purgatory and the power of the mass. If you read Justo Gonzalez, he's going to cover this. And basically, Augustine, who wrote so much stuff, again, remember, he's trying to do retractions because he realized he just wrote so much stuff, he doesn't even know what he wrote. Um, Augustine, at one point, theorized about the possibility of some kind of purification, that somehow after you die, obviously, you can't be just like immediately prepared to go to heaven. There has to be some kind of purification process well, Gregory is going to be the one that expands that and begins to give this concept of purgatory a little bit more of a, um, a doctrinal kind of basis to it. The power of the Mass, apparently at one point Gregory is celebrating the Mass and he sees, uh, he has a vision of Christ being crucified again and he really begins to develop this concept that at the Mass Christ is re-crucified and there is almost a re-sacrificing of him. And so when you receive the body and blood, you're receiving almost uh, the benefits of salvation again. And so, again, he is developing these thoughts. He's not a theologian. He doesn't understand some of them, but he is trying to make these things a little bit easier for people to understand. He's going to emphasize clerical celibacy. He's going to take Augustine's view, and he's going to say that anyone who is a priest or anyone who is a leader in the church should be celibate, and if you're married... Uh, you need to just absolve that or uh, commit, I guess, the celibacy in that because uh, all priests should be celibate. He's possibly the originator of the Gregorian chant. It's debated, but the reason it's called Gregorian chant is because the assumption is it's somehow associated with Gregory. So the, I, I can't even know how to do it. Um, you know, I don't know how it goes, but anyway, the Gregorian chant, that kind of, Music and worship was what Gregory the Great is somewhere associated with. What do you learn from his life? I would say he, he was a man of humility. He did not want this position. Uh, he was very organized. There was a lot of good things he did. But I would say never underestimate the power of your influence. His teaching has shaped millions of people for 1,500 years. I don't think he necessarily um, understood all that his teaching would do but it did have a great impact. This is actually from the Catholic Encyclopedia on Gregory the Great, and here's what it says about him. It says, it will be best, it will be best to clear the ground by admitting, frankly, what Gregory was not. He was not a man of profound learning, not a philosopher, not a conversationalist, hardly even a theologian in the constructive sense of the term, he was a trained Roman lawyer and an administrator, a monk, a missionary, a preacher, above all, a physician of souls and a leader of men. His great claim to remembrance lies in the fact that he is the real father of the medieval papacy. Nor is his work less noteworthy in its effect on the temporal position of the papacy. Seizing the opportunity which circumstances offered, he made himself in Italy a power stronger than emperor or exarch and established a political influence which dominated the peninsula for centuries. And that's the Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 6. So even they admit that he had a massive impact on medieval Catholicism, even though he was not a theologian and really was not very good at understanding the Bible. <laughs> Remember, he was a civil leader that was made into a church leader, did a great job from the organizational standpoint, but he messed up a lot of stuff in theology that's going to impact the church for many years down the road. Um, let me pause there. Any questions? Because I know that's, depending on your background, maybe you have some questions about that. Um, what, did, what did he mess up? What, what? Uh, purgatory, okay. penance, the re-sacrifice of Christ and really elevating his role even above civil leaders, that basically the church is going to take a position that we have power. We're the sun, 
and the civil political leader is the moon. And that's going to really start with him. I don't think he intended some of this. I think he was trying to be helpful. But again, decisions you make trajectory-wise begin to influence things for the next few centuries. Uh, there's debate. I mean, there's some of the early church fathers you can read. And, you know, you're dealing with symbolic language. And so when people say that you're partaking of the body and blood of Christ, you don't know if, if they're speaking in just common figurative language or if they meant something more. Most people would say, and Houston Gonzalez would say, that really didn't develop fully until a guy named Red Burtis in about 800 that he began to really believe that it was actually the body and blood. Catholics would disagree with that assessment because they would find some other statements made by early church fathers. I think those early church fathers are saying what Jesus said, which I think common sense tells you it's symbolic language. But eventually it's going to take on transubstantiation. Uh, what Gregory was basically saying is that there is... Um, there is so much power in those elements that Christ is like being re-sacrificed for you. And as you partake, it's almost like a, an extra dose of forgiveness. And that's dangerous because it denies the sufficiency of the once-for-all death of Christ. So, yes, Tracy. Uh, on page oh, the medieval church period was characterized by power. So you have the age of persecution, the age of prosperity, and the age of power. Power. Someone else said there. Oh, Kathy? I don't think so. I think um, uh, Houston Gonzalez basically says he theorized about it. I don't know. I've never read retractions. Um, if anybody wants to read it. Um, here's what it says. Uh, Gregory lived in a time of superstition, and to, agree, to a degree he reflected his age. By making Augustine an infallible teacher, he contradicted the spirit of that teacher, whose genius was, at least in part, in his inquiring spirit and venturesome mind. Basically, Gregory Gregory saw everything Augustine wrote is just spot on. Augustine was one of those guys that's a philosopher. Sometimes he writes stuff that he's just speculating about. What for Augustine was conjecture and Gregory became certainty. Thus, for instance, the theologian of Hippo had suggested the possibility there was a place of purification for those who died in sin where they would spend some time before going to heaven. On the basis of these speculations of Augustine, Gregory affirmed the existence of such a place and gave impetus to the development of the doctrine of purgatory. So I, don't, I can't give you much more information than that just to say, Augustine speculated about it. Gregory took it as gospel truth, and it just begins to develop from there. Yes, Mike. The formulaic, what they say during the Latin Mass? I think Gregory the Great may have had a role in that. I'm trying to... Remember where I saw something about him formalizing a lot of the liturgy? Um, yeah, instituted changes in the Roman liturgy. So I'd have to research and find out what that means, but my guess is there was probably some rudimentary elements to it, and just over time it began to develop. Gregory the Great may have been the one that helped develop it further. I, I'd have to look at that. I don't know. Yes? Yes? Yes. Right. Yeah, well, Christ said, do this in remembrance of me. If you remember last week, I talked about in the Hebrew mindset, biblical mindset, remembrance is more than just a casual thing. 
it is a focus. And so communion is, God understands that we need reminders, that we uh, need things to, you know, you think about all the memorial stones in the Old Testament. There's something happens and they put a memorial stone. It's to remind them. And when your kids ask, it's a, an opportunity for you to describe it. I think what that's doing is, is reminding the church over and over again at the centerpiece of what we do is the, is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And so the remembrance is, it's a symbol that is to remind me again of the central focus. That is, I think, the understanding of communion. What Catholicism is going to start doing is making it more of a, uh, a means of grace. You get something um, a merit by partaking that enables you to have more grace, an infusion of more grace that is progressive. And I'm going to talk a little bit probably next week about the difference between a, a Protestant understanding of salvation and a Catholic. But a Catholic one is more of a progress. Um, and however far you make it across the bridge of life, you may have to finish in purgatory and you just need to accumulate more and more merit, and that which you don't have, you got to go through a time in purgatory. I don't know if I'm even answering your question, but I think it's, it's a reminder to us, and we are to participate. We're just to, to remember that Christ's death was totally sufficient, not try to add to it something that, in addition. The ritual is not going to cleanse you. Exactly. The ritual is to remind you of what has already happened. I'd say the same thing about baptism. Uh, just get, oh, we don't have a baptism back there anymore. Just getting, <laughs> just getting dunked in water is just getting dunked in water. Its meaning comes from understanding this is a picture of what's happened to me. I was dead in my sin. I've been immersed in Christ. I've been raised to new life. When you start saying that there's something magical in what I say or there's something magical in the water, I think you're bringing in almost a superstitious kind of thing. I think it's to remind us of what has happened. It's a physical reminder of a spiritual reality. But, yes, Andy. Okay. Yeah. Remind me afterwards what the name of that is. Yeah. There is a lot. Um, if you look at Catholicism and the way they do things, it is very similar to what you see in the Jewish faith. Uh, there are priests who have a line uh, that comes. There's sacrifices that are done. Uh, people depend on the priests to be the mediators um, in their relationship there's the tabernacle. I mean, there's all these kind of things. I would say uh, the roots to that ignores the fact that those things were completed in Jesus Christ. And so to go back to the old covenant is to ignore what Christ has done. And so I think, and I don't know what the book is saying, but if, there's, if it's trying to argue that what happens today because it looks like Jewish religion, it must be have biblical roots, I would say, well, that ignores the entire book of Hebrews and the fact that God has once for all, uh, Christ's sacrifice was once for all, and he was so sufficient that thankfully we don't have to continue to do those things, and we all have immediate access. The veil has been removed. But anyway, let me finish this, and then if you have more questions, then um, we won't have time for them, so just wait till next week. <laughs> I want to end on a positive note. I think I can cover Patrick. Ha! <laughs> Five minutes. We'll try our best. Um, I love the story of Patrick. My fourth son, his middle name is Patrick. Unfortunately, when you get to St. Patrick, it's so hard for us to divorce uh, legend from reality. And in fact, he's almost been made to be a cartoonish kind of figure. I'm even looking for pictures of Patrick. I can't find any without him having the you know, the shamrock or, uh, you know, some, some kind of strange legend. I think the legend detracts from the remarkable life that this man lived, and I'm sad that the legend has clouded uh, the impact this man had. 
He grew up along the shores of England. We don't know exactly where. Uh, there's, the place is called Benavim Taberni or whatever. No one knows where it is. Lots of cities claim it because I guess it's a tourist thing. So it's been put in Scotland, it's been put in Wales, it's been put down in southern England, it's also been put there. We don't know exactly where it was, but we do know it was along the coast because at the age of 16, he grows up in a nominally Christian family. He is not a believer. He really thinks it's all a bunch of uh, garbage for show. He is not one that's taken to believe in any of it. He's really a mocker in many ways of Christian belief. He commits some sin at the age of 15. He never reveals exactly what it was, but it was so serious. He tells a friend about it, and the friend ends up publicizing it, and he almost loses uh, his position later in life because of this sin he committed at age 15. My best guess is sexual immorality of some sort. But he's taken as a slave at the age of 16. Imagine being 16 years old, and you wake up, and these Irish raiders have come over to your hometown and begin to kill people and pillage, and they grab you, and they take you back to Ireland to be a slave. That's what happened to him. He became a slave in Ireland. Ireland was a godless place. They practiced cannibalism. They practiced human sacrifice. There's about 150 tribes. There's all these tribal wars going on. They had druids who were doing all kinds of magical incantations. It was a crazy place. He becomes the, his master is a guy that's just sort of a, a brute guy that uh, loves to display the heads of his uh, people that he's killed around his uh, yard. And so that's got to be a wonderful place to to uh, grow up, you know, seeing all these heads all around on these poles. He is charged to take care of the man's pigs and his livestock. He is, um, he's basically starving in many ways. He is just in probably the lowest point that you could possibly be. And during that time, he begins to turn to God. Um, if you want to read a great book on Patrick, I recommend Philip Freeman, uh, St. Patrick of Ireland. Uh, he says this, uh, God used, this is what Patrick says, God used the time to shape and mold me into something better. He made me into what I am now, someone very different from what I once was, someone who can care about others and work to help them. Before I was a slave, I didn't even care about myself. Then Philip Freeman goes on, as the years in Ireland passed, something began to slowly change inside Patrick. He had laughed at the priests in Britain behind their backs and rolled his eyes with his friends during the church services he was forced to attend. But now, with the cold wind biting his face and the never-ending rain soaking his skin, the idea of a God who loved and cared for his own took on a new appeal. A cynic might say that a desperate person will grasp at any hope, real or imaginary, but others would say that, as with Jonah in the belly of the great fish, it often takes a true calamity for someone to pay attention to a God who was always there. And that's what Patrick discovered. He was humbled. He began to pray. He began to seek after the God who he had rejected. And God's love just converts him and changes him. I was 16 years old. I knew not the true God, but in that strange land, the Lord opened up my unbelieving eyes. And although late, I called my sins to mind and I was converted with my whole heart to the Lord my God, who regarded my low estate, had pity on my youth and ignorance, and consoled me as a father consoles his children. And so he is uh, changed and converted during those six years as a slave. He has a vision one night that God's telling him to escape, and so he escapes, he travels, uh, they say 200 miles, I don't know how accurate that is. He finds a boat, and the boat, uh, there's a whole story on how he ends up on the boat, but he eventually escapes. We don't see him for another 18 years, uh, we don't know. These are called the silent years. We don't really even have a good sense of where he was born, when he was born, when he died. You can find all kinds of different dates. There's just a lot of mystery around some of those details because uh, the only real records we have are the things that Patrick wrote. But at the age of 40, he's called back to the one place he probably hesitated to go. <laughs> you can imagine spending six years of your life as a slave to a, basically a pagan guy and escaping uh, I'm sure there was a lot of, uh, took a lot of time for him to try to process this, but as he got to be age 40, he has a calling to go back to the one place you can't imagine he would go back to, Ireland. 
Patrick is not from Ireland. He was captured in England and taken over there as a slave, but God called him back to the place that, where he was a slave. He becomes a missionary there. Uh, there are 150 different tribes. He basically begins to focus on each tribe, and he tries to befriend the leader of that tribe. He tries to do education there. He tries to teach the people, and he tries to just bring them to a place of conversion, and if there's conversion, he plants a church, establishes some leadership, and then he moves on to the next tribe. He used redemptive analogies. He found things in their culture. He understood their culture, and he tried to find ways to teach truth through that, they had a, a belief in the power of three, and so they did have that concept of the shamrock, and apparently he used that to teach uh, the, the Trinity. Um, they also had human sacrifice, and basically the, a druid, this kind of priest-lawyer thing, uh, had all this power. Sometimes their firstborn son was set aside and raised, uh, pampered basically the early part of his life, preparing him to be, it said voluntary sacrifice. I don't know how voluntary it might have been, but that concept he took and he began to say, the God of the universe has already sacrificed his son. You don't need to continue to do this. They had something called triple death. Uh, over there in that part of the world, they found these bodies in these bogs. These bogs have basically preserved these human bodies that have been sacrificed to such a degree, they can, they can even analyze what's in the person's stomach and see what they ate before they were killed. But what they would do to sacrifice a human, they called it triple death. They would give you three axe blows to the head. They would tie a three-knotted cord around your neck. And while they are asphyxiating you and while you're, you know, <laughs> your head's been bashed in, they would slit your throat. And they called that triple death. The victim was usually the firstborn son of a druid set aside and raised to be willing sacrifice. What they've noticed about these sacrifices, they were unblemished. They had manicured nails and no calluses. So they were pampered uh, for this sacrifice, which they thought appeased the gods. And Patrick used that to say God has already given a sacrifice. And so he began to change um, Ireland. He brought the gospel to Ireland. By the end of his life, he planted around 700 churches. Uh, about 40 of the 150 tribes were converted to Christianity. Uh, he was instrumental in bringing an end to slavery. He is one of the first people that adamantly wrote uh, against slavery. And why do you think he would write adamantly against slavery? <laughs> he was a slave, and he knew how... Uh, demeaning it was and how it was an abomination uh, that we were all made in the image of God and what happened to him he did not want to happen to anyone else and so he's one of the first uh, Christians that in a very powerful vocal way begins to attack uh, the institution of slavery and begins to change what's interesting is um, the guy that was his slave owner he had a heart for and he wanted to reach him with the gospel um, a guy's name was Miliok, Miliuk. Um, Patrick had a heart for this guy and wanted to see him one to Christ. And so it says, Patrick resolved early in his mission to, the retur to return to the region where he lived as a slave. Patrick wanted to pay the bond money for his ransom to the Druid Miliak, now an old man, who had bought him from the slave traders. He actually wanted to pay him back, you know, so he didn't lose money because he escaped. He wanted to tell him about Christ who paid the ransom for Miliuk's freedom from sin and death. When Miliuk heard that Patrick was en route to see him, he locked himself inside his house and burned it down. So he obviously did not want to face uh, his former slave. He probably knew how he treated him. Maybe he didn't understand what he would do, but he decided I'd rather kill myself uh, than hear, uh, meet this man again. He uh, uh, laid the foundation for Celtic Christianity. Um, Celtic Christianity developed differently than Roman Christianity. There's a lot that I love about Celtic Christianity, and I think uh, there's a lot that you can take from it. He believed in continuous prayer. He had a sense of God's presence in everything he did. It just governed the way he thought and lived. Celtic Christianity also has an emphasis on artistic expression. They just uh, they loved music. They loved artistry. Uh, there's just a lot in Celtic Christianity that is very beautiful. 
Uh, someone was just telling me that one of their books they like is the Thomas K. Hill, How the Irish Saved Civilization. I have not read it, um, but I, it's probably very good in how Patrick's influence changed Ireland and how that eventually changed the world. But I want to end tonight, and again, if you have more questions, we can try to, you can come up and ask me, and I'll try to answer them the best I can. But I love St. Patrick's Breastplate on, on page 26. It's probably my, famous, uh, my favorite ancient prayer. Patrick faced um, the possibility of death just about every day. He lived with the understanding he was ministering to pagan people that were not um, friendly to him. They oftentimes put curses on him. They tried to kill him. And this is reported to be his prayer. We don't know for sure. But it certainly was inspired by him if it wasn't, um, if all the words were not directly written by him. But let me just read this as our, our closing prayer. And to me, it's just, I, I love it. I arise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity through belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. I arise today through the strength of Christ's birth with his baptism, through the strength of his crucifixion with his burial. Through the strength of his resurrection and his ascension, through the strength of his descent for the judgment of doom. I arise today through the strength of the love of cherubim and the obedience of angels and the service of archangels and the hope of the resurrection to meet with reward and the prayers of patriarchs and the predictions of prophets and the preaching of apostles and the faith of confessors and the innocence of holy virgins and the deeds of righteous men. I arise today through the strength of heaven, the light of the sun, the radiance of the moon, the splendor of fire, the speed of lightning, the swiftness, swiftness of wind, the depth of the sea, the stability of the earth, the firmness of rock. I arise today through God's strength to pilot me, God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to guide me, God's eye to look before me, God's ear to hear me, God's word to speak for me, God's hand to guard me, God's shield to protect me, God's host to save me from snares of devils, from temptation of vices, from everyone who shall wish me ill afar and near. I summon today all these powers between me and those evils against every cruel and merciless power that may oppose my body and soul, against incantations of false prophets, against the black laws of pagandom, against false laws of heretics, against the craft of idolatry, against spells of witches and smiths and wizards, against every knowledge that corrupts man's body and soul. Christ has shielded me today against poison, against burning, against drowning, against wounding, so that there may come to me an abundance of reward. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arise, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. I rise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. That is so powerful. <laughs> and um, it just makes me love the heart of St. Patrick. Uh, let me close in prayer. Father, may we not go... Um, May we not just grow to the place where we forget how awesome it is to be in Christ. Father, may we never forget your sacrifice. May we never forget your love. Just May we just try to understand the width and the depth and the length and the height of your love so that we be filled with all the fullness that you offer us in Christ. Father, just change our hearts. Uh, conform us more and more into the image of your Son. And thank you for the lives of those who've gone before us. May we live faithfully in our present generation for your glory. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. See you next week.